Viewers of my channel probably already know that I've been planning this Swish Loop trip for some time now. I think the whole world probably already knows how it ends. But before we get to that, we have some traveling to do. Situated northwest of Ottawa in a neighboring province of Quebec, the Loop is an 800 kilometer trip into some of the most remote regions of the province. Getting there from my home in Kitchener is a bit of a hike however, so I decided to split it up into two days of initial travel with a planned lunch stop in Peterborough, Ontario. But before we get too far into the trip, it's time for another episode of Amazing, amazing Useless amazing, Facts useless, on the 401. Useless, 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 useless. The section of 401 that runs through the Greater Toronto Area opens up to a mass of 18 lanes of through traffic in some spots. To help manage the heaviest flow of traffic in North America, the freeway uses one of the largest stretches of express and collector lanes in the world. Collector lanes are barriers separated from the main express lanes and are designed to handle local traffic which requires access to the surface streets through your typical freeway on and off ramps. This gives the express lanes uninterrupted flow through the region without constant attempts of motorists trying to merge into the high speed through traffic. Sections of the collector lanes are joined to the expressway by way of transfers, basically strategically placed high-speed multi-lane on and off ramps which help make merging in the traffic flow easier and smoother. A not too commonly known fact about this system of carriageways is that the signage for the express lanes are the typical green highway sign color while the collector lane signs are blue, helping drivers differentiate between the two. Heading northwest away from the 401, I decided to take the less traveled 407 express toll road. This privatized toll network uses an array of cameras to read the license plates of vehicles entering and exiting the roadway and billing them accordingly and steeply. Not too long and we're out of the city and hitting the back roads to Peterborough. One of the great attractions to the area is one of two hydraulic lift locks along the 386 kilometer Trent Severn waterway, this one being lock number 21. Driving underneath the structure in this tight single lane tunnel and seeing the water seeping through doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, especially given its age. Lexi and I decided this would make a great spot for a bit of lunch, and maybe we'll be lucky enough to get to see the lock in action. At one time, the two lifts were the highest hydraulic boat lifts in the world, at 65 feet, and at the time of construction in 1904, it was the largest unreinforced concrete structure in the world. The lock uses a pair of massive, gated, 140 foot long bathtub like caissons to carry boats up and down on huge 7.5 foot rams which are hydraulically connected together through a control valve. What's even more amazing about the lock is that it functions without the need of external power. The ascending and descending of the caissons are done with just the use of gravity. In principle, when one caisson reaches the upper portion of the lock, it stops 12 inches short of the upper water level at the canal, at which point the gate opens and an extra 144 tons of water flows in, raising the boats in the caisson to the same level of the canal. This also ensures that the top caisson is always heavier than the bottom one. With our hunger satiated, it was time to get moving and find a spot to spend the night. Heading out of Peterborough towards an eventual border crossing in Pembroke, we made a stop for gas at a nearby service station. Of course, this being the official kick off the summer with a Canada Day long weekend, the station was typically overflowing with vacationers. We couldn't get out of there fast enough. Venturing down the Trans-Canada Highway towards Caledar, and you can still see evidence of the blowdown from the derecho that came blowing through Ontario last spring. Now heading north on 41, I previously scanned ahead the area using the iOverlander app and located a few potential overnight camp spots to spend the night before we crossed into Quebec. Well, it turns out most easily accessible and scenic spots in the app are no doubt popular with boondockers. The spot I wanted was occupied with an empty boat trailer. So it was on to plan B at this point, which is to say, hoping the next spot on our way was unoccupied. Back up once again Highway 41 and past the Bonacle Provincial Park. If all else fails, we could possibly spend the night there. However, one location stood out which seemed to hold some promise in that app. And a curious location at that. An old abandoned airfield not too far off the main highway. 
Well, at least the iOverlander app said it was abandoned. Just to be safe, we decided to set up in the far corner of the strip anyways. Who knows, the runway could still be used for emergency landings. At the very least, this spot gave us some wide open space and some peace and quiet with the hopes that the mosquitoes wouldn't be too bad. I decided for this trip, I should renew my can of bear spray and grab the new sprayer at Mountain Equipment Company in Kitchener. As they say, better safe than sorry. With Lexi all set up and settled in, it was time to throw together a quick dinner. Nothing too fancy for our first day on the road. Just a couple of tube steaks with some fried onions. I picked up a new, slightly larger cast iron pan before this trip, so this was the first time I got to use it. I did manage a seasoning session to it before we left, however. kind of funny. I could have swore that these hot dog buns I bought were uncut, so I kind of messed up by top slicing them open. Oh well, no complaints here, nor from Lexi. During our dinner, a massive toy hauler slash camper showed up behind an equally huge diesel pickup truck, and naturally they had a gas generator. Thankfully they were parked far enough away that we couldn't barely hear it. With a short dog walk done, it was time to relax with a cold beverage. The swarms of deer flies gave way to swarms of dragonflies, a natural predator to the super annoying flies. Lexi could have cared less to whatever flying insect was the pest du jour. To her, it was an annoyance regardless. It seems everything is fair game to a dog.
After enjoying a beautiful sunset, it was just about time to turn in. Lexi loves spending time up in the tent, so she has no qualms about letting me know when it's time to turn in. The next morning, with the sun still low on the horizon, it was already incredibly warm and humid. A trend, it turns out, would carry right on through the entire week. Today, however, we were going to make the push into Quebec and start off on the loop. So it was just a quick hot cup of coffee and a granola bar before we packed it all up and headed off. Back on the highway and heading north towards Renfrew, the humidity and the poor air quality from the forest fires was quite evident. It's a kind of unsettled, heavy, humid air that likes to spring up and scatter showers on you in the moment's notice. And this, as it turned out, was our notice. We rolled into Pembroke and the skies absolutely opened up. Flash flooding was pretty evident on the roads with pools forming all over the place. Thankfully, as quick as it came, it left just as fast. And our gas stop provided a bit of canopy over our heads. I decided this would be the best opportunity to fill the 20 liter can on the roof and for a couple reasons. Not least of which was my concern with potentially overloading the roof. This would give me the chance to test it on relatively smooth pavement before heading off road to make sure everything was alright. And the other reason to gas up now is the expectedly higher gas prices heading into the long weekend and traveling further north. Just over 500 kilometers into the trip so far and at 11.1 .1 liters per 100 kilometers, surprisingly decent mileage. Over the bridge, across the Ottawa River into Quebec and we're officially on the loop near Rochon. Coming over this little rise and we spooked a soaking wet bear cub crossing the road. This was the first of a few bear sightings, but the only one I managed to get on video. Some more off and on rain and you could plainly see in some areas of the road just how much damage can occur with the strong moving water. I wasn't looking to get stuck and having to self recover so early on my trip so I navigated the hills and the road pretty cautiously.
While I didn't really need four wheel drive at this point, I engaged four high anyway, just so I could disconnect the sway bar, which noticeably helped with a smoother ride. I also hadn't aired down the tires as of yet, but the roads weren't that terrible thus far. Quite a bit of the low-lying areas were puddling up pretty good. I could only imagine what this loop would look like in the springtime. Every scenic meadow or lake we came across, Lexi keenly took notice. I think so far she was enjoying the trip. This close to civilization, and clearly on some still used logging roads, the single lane bridge crossings were seemingly in pretty good shape. As it turns out, later in our journey, we've learned that not all bridge crossings are created equal. Sway bar disconnect once again, just to help the ride. It was getting later into the afternoon now, and while venturing into an active logging area, we decided to look for a spot to spend the night. Lexi and I had allotted lots of time for this trip, so there was no need or want to put in long driving days. We happened to find this little side clearing beside the road, and we decided to set up there. With the flies becoming ever more bothersome, I decided to pull out and fire up the thermocell to see if that would help. Lexi was content to stretch out and lay down on her dog bed, while I went about my business. When the flies got too much for her, she hopped into the back of the Bronco for some relief. I decided now was a good time as any to finally air down. Nothing too crazy, just 30 PSI to smooth out the ride a little bit more. With us all set up, it was time to pull out a cold one and reload the fridge with some more drinks, then get going with some dinner. On the menu tonight, fish tacos.
With a deliciously refreshing citrus rattler paired with that filling dinner, it was time for a little break and take in the solitude and the sounds of nature. Another adventurous day in the books, another beautiful sunset, and all the chores done. Time for some early evening entertainment before turning in. The next morning, again, already very hot and humid, it was a bit of a rush to get everything packed for the travel day. Off to day three on the loop. Our second day on the loop started off like the first. With some overnight showers, some of the low-lying areas were expectedly mucky and wet. Some sections, however, showed signs of previously more extreme water erosion like this channel cut into the left side track here. It may not look like it on film, but I got the bad mule pretty tippy keeping it to the right to avoid putting a wheel into that. Not long after, we happened upon a section marked on the map as a washout. Again on video, it doesn't look too bad, but I was super weary of all the debris across it. And being mostly a mud base, I decided after scanning the map, it's an easy and quick bypass. Turns out that bypass kind of worked in our favor. The road took us along this beautiful lake, and so far on our venture, access to large bodies of water have been slim to none. So after happening upon this boat launch, we decided it was a good opportunity to grab some water for filtering and get our feet wet. What we came to realize later, that this lake had dozens of cottages on it, and maybe it was just a coincidence, but after filtering the lake water, it definitely had a delicious, dish soapy, gray water and premix taste to it. I didn't realize it at the time, but when I see Lexi approaching the water now, I'm pretty sure this was her very first time being exposed to something like a lake. 
We were now definitely on some better maintained and higher trafficked roads. But if there's one thing I can say about the Swisher Loop now, is that it was definitely curated to get you off those main dirt roads and into the scrub. But following the loop on Gaia turned out to be a bit challenging. Zoomed out, you can easily make out your heading and route, but when it came to zooming in for directional changes, you can see the route in some instances doesn't properly follow the trail. This caused some frequent wrong turns and subsequent turnarounds, something I really wanted to avoid because of the tight fuel range. For instance, this intersection here. I wrongfully assumed the route went right on the nice wide smooth road and on Gaia GPS the direction wasn't obvious until I ventured far enough off the road that I could see my map icon arrow going the wrong way. And as soon as I came across the next washout crossing, I knew I had to be going the right way. At one time this used to be a bridge crossing, but no longer. Onto some grassy two track and I disconnect the sway bar again, just for a steadier ride. It's definitely less travel down here and still mucky and wet in a lot of the areas. A lot of times the loop will take you off and cut between main roads and you eventually end up back on some nice wide forestry roads for short stints. If one were interested in a less arduous trip, you could easily navigate these better maintained roads, but then you'd be missing out on half the fun. A few times I came across some crews out here working on the infrastructure, keeping the main routes passable. I used an alternate audio track here because well, as soon as Lexi saw somebody, she'd just absolutely lose it. It seems like a few days alone in the woods and every person she sees is someone that is a potential threat. Not too long after that, we were back off the main road and into a series of challenges. The first of which, this washed out downhill section. After getting out to have a better look, I decided the best line was to try to keep right at the ditch and then cut back to straddle it. And the Broncos onboard cameras come in real handy here. Again, on camera, the descent and the misperception of size and depth of the trench is misleading. Dropping a wheel in there would have been serious trouble. This next part was super fun, but slow going. I was really paying attention to the wheel placement, my biggest concern being slicing open a tire sidewall on a sharp half buried rock. Most of the rocks here were loose and just bowling ball size, nothing like the boulders you see on the trails out in California or Moab. But still, being solo in the middle of nowhere, you pay attention to what you're driving over.
When it comes to a skewed camera perspective, this little gully takes the cake. I'm taking it in four low. The drop in and departure are both nearly 45 degrees, making for a very tight pinch at the bottom. The stubby two door Bronco makes easy work of it, but a full size long wheelbase pickup would no doubt drag its ass through here. This water crossing no doubt has been around for a long time and it's pretty evident of the patchwork repairs, but it turns out to be a very structurally sound bridge. This particular section of the loop I wasn't very fond of. Super tight and overgrown with brush, it made for some not very reassuring scrapes and scratch sounds the entire way. With my small branch saw stowed away in the rooftop box, I resorted to just pushing some of the more offending looking branches out of the road. Once clear of the pinstripe factory, it was on to some more major logging roads and the perfect time to look for a spot for the night. I turned off near a gravel pit and eventually came to the small siding to set up, a good a place as any. first order of business was getting some lake water filtered as we were getting quite low on potable water. Also, using one of my two identical Rotopax cans for lake water, I definitely don't want to make the mistake of mixing them up. A nice cold beer on this sweltering hot afternoon, a quick chili dog dinner, and the brutally annoying deer flies to keep us company. I decided I could maybe put something together for Lexi with my fly screen netting, who was obviously being hounded by the flies pretty bad. And this is what the initial setup looked like. She seemed pretty content in there, albeit a little smothered. How are you doing? Are you good? Your tail's wagging. Good job, man. I grabbed some unused tent fly poles and wedged them into the chair fabric to create a kind of structure to help lift off the netting and give Lexi a little more space. She seemed pretty content to spend the rest of the day in there while we waited for the night to come. The following morning we woke to another hot and humid day after getting a good shower soaking last night. A quick bagel and coffee breakfast and it was time to pack up and head down the road over the border to Rapi Dawakim to gas up at the local SO. Super friendly staff there and they all just fell in love with Lexi. A still respectable 11.5 liters per 100k overall average and 16.3 liters since our fuel top up in Pembroke. Heading back into the loop, we stopped at the Zekduamin registration office to pay the $12 entrance fee. As it turns out, when you register, you let them know how long you plan on staying. But what I didn't know is that you have to drop off your registration form when you exit the ZEC so they know that you're no longer in the area in case of wildfires or emergencies. 
While thus far I've been running 30 PSI in the tires, I decided with the respectable mileage you've been getting in the Bronco, I can afford to run the tires a little lower and it makes a noticeable difference in the ride. Well worth the extra gas. On some of the main roads, we're able to make time and travel at a speed where the truck actually has decent fuel economy, not crawling around at 10 kilometers an hour over rough terrain. Heading up to the northern reaches of the loop, we come across this beautiful sand lot right next to a scenic lake. One of the Swish Loop Facebook page members asked about areas to camp that could accommodate six or more vehicles. If you're watching this video, definitely mark this one on your map. I kind of wish we would have traveled further yesterday and spent last night here instead of the gravel pit. I probably would have spent a couple of nights here at least. Just beautiful. I decided to dump the dirty dish water that I grabbed at the last lake and refill my rotopacks with some of this lake water, which was noticeably cleaner. Back on the road and making good time again, but it's always worth the while to stop and take in the scenery whenever possible. A little ways up the road and we come across another airstrip in the middle of nowhere. It looks as if someone purposely barricaded the path into it, so maybe this one isn't abandoned. We also saw evidence of a recent burn here. It doesn't look too extensive, just the low lying brush. A section on the map that I marked previously while doing trip research was a little area that looked like water rapids from the satellite imagery. And it so happens there was a trail leading into the way. What I failed to notice on the map, however, were the elevation lines. I'm just glad I didn't traverse my way into here in the dark. It would have made for a great camp spot on the opposite side of the river though. A word of caution, be wary of the roadway if you're traveling large sections of it at speed. More than once I had to jump on the brakes for these little sinkholes crossing the lane. It might have been okay if I crossed at high speed, but at moderate speed it would have been a massive hit and potentially damaging. And from what I expected from the loop, it wasn't long before we were off the main roads and into the rough stuff again. One thing I didn't realize while spending this amount of time off-roading is how stiff and sore my neck and shoulders became, craning up over the hood watching where you were going. This section of road led us across one of the better water crossings on the Swisha. Not terribly deep, but nice and wide and a firm bottom. Child's play. And another section of tight bush again. A section I could have done without if I'm honest. It eventually led us to a shallow filled in crossing which was obviously sturdy enough and with a short span it was easily navigated.
Further along it got a little wetter with narrow and flooded sections for some distance. If I had to turn around along here, it would have been pretty difficult. This part of the loop, if I remember correctly, is the beaver dam area marked on the map. It's pretty wild seeing how high the water is just beside the trail at spots, with only some dirt and sticks keeping it back. With the shadows getting longer, we started scoping for a spot for the night. While not quite a lakefront beach area, we found this clearing that would do just fine. Because of the heat and mostly because of the flies, we've been traveling mostly with the windows up and the AC on keeping a close eye on fuel consumption. I took inventory of the brush and damage to the truck on those tight spots, but it seemed we fared pretty well. I quick dusting off of the solar panel and already the heat was getting to me. I swear the humidity had to be close to 100% as well. Just no relief, even in the late afternoon. Well, almost no relief. Poor dog, trying to stay out of the sun inside the truck must have been feeling pretty miserable, but I tried to keep her as comfortable as I could. Puppies. Lexi, come here. Come here, lay down. Fan, honey. It's a fan, honey. but we had to take turns in front of the fan. It turned out the rest of the week we'd be suffering with this heat and humidity seemingly with no break apart from the occasional rain shower. We didn't stop for lunch break this time and I was eager to get dinner going. And for tonight, an easy meal I love and one that I haven't had in forever, the Philly cheese steak. The real key to a good Philly is slicing your steak as thin as you can. Traditionalists will tell you the only other ingredient to the sandwich is onion, but I've always favored red pepper with mine as well. Others go so far as to add mushrooms, or God forbid, even lettuce to their filly. Please stop doing that.
The reason for the thinly sliced meat is to get a nice crispness to the steak. If you've ever had a smash burger before, it's kind of the same idea. A dash of salt and pepper, lots of heat, and cooking the veg just long enough to keep some crunch to it. Some would argue on the type of cheese that traditionally belongs on a Philly, but marble cheddar is what I had on hand. Provolone or Swisha, I mean Swiss, is just as good however. With the sun finally heading towards the horizon, it was dinner time at last with my special girl. And a close to another beautiful day in Quebec. The morning of July 4th, Lexi and I woke to yet another incredibly hot and humid morning. At this time of day, with the sun low on the horizon, we at least weren't bothered by the flies as of yet, which was a nice relief. But it wasn't long before we realized that overnight, we were invaded by some other unknown flying species of insect. For breakfast this morning, it was a BLT without the LT and a bit of shredded cheese just for good measure. The invading insect, however, was some type of moth, it seemed. Apparently they took up residence on the Bronco and tent overnight and were content just to hang out and stay for the morning. But my main concern was that they were maybe munching on the tent fabric, which wasn't cool. They were easily shooed away, however, but if you accidentally swatted one, 
They basically just disintegrated into a mess of wing dust. With most of the moss cleared off and us all packed up, it was back under the loop for yet another day of adventure. With the weather being as hot and muggy as it was, at least it was with clear and sunny skies. We've had some overnight rain on this trip, but nothing to spoil the adventure. When I was planning for this trip, I had downloaded all the needed maps to my Gaia app on my Android phone before setting off. Getting lost was something I really wanted to avoid. However, once we set off on the trail, it was only then that I learned that Gaia no longer had Android Auto support. Thankfully, on my old iPhone, I also had the Gaia app installed, and it supported Apple CarPlay, but I didn't have the maps saved locally to the device. In most areas, all I was able to see was some basic topography, our route, and the location icon. On this day, our first day of our summer holidays, we were about to hit a milestone with the Bronco. Delivered new in November 2021, after a year and a half of trouble-free motoring, we rolled over the 50,000 kilometer mark. Because of the navigation issues, we initially drove past the Lake Brule fuel stop marked on the route. So far from our last stop up, we were down a half a tank. The gas here on this day was $2 a liter. $60 filled us back up and the trip computer showed we covered 179 kilometers with a decent 14.5 liters per 100 kilometer fuel consumption rate. This section along the north side of the trail had some well-maintained and wide roads that allowed us to travel at a relatively more efficient speed. When I reset the tripometer at Lake Brule, it showed 391 kilometers to empty. Almost already 31 kilometers out and we were up to 399 kilometers to empty. A welcome relief considering our next gas stop was a long ways off yet. Even though we didn't see any logging trucks this day, this region definitely showed more signs of activity than the rest of the loop thus far. When it came to forks in the road like this one, with the map and navigation issues we were having, it was basically a 50-50 guess as to which way to go. It wasn't until you traveled far enough down the trail and your location icon came off the route line on the map that you knew you made the wrong choice or not. We eventually ended up maxing out at about 442 kilometers to empty after almost 100 kilometers since our gas stop. Before too long, however, the route took us off the main two-lane road and back into the, some secondary trails. A lot of the area up here was at elevation, so in some spots, you could see off into the distance quite well in some of the clearings. Another one of the many critters to cross our path on this trip was this little baby groundhog. Or was that a baby beaver? Adorable, whatever it was. Yet another crossroads, but this one pretty clear on which way we have to go. We were now across the northern section and heading south, down the eastern side of the loop. Even though the road got rougher and narrower, the surface looked like a mix of dirt and packed sand with very little rock, which still allowed us some higher speeds. Of course still, some low-lying areas still puddled up, but weren't completely washed out. I was still cautious however, not wanting to damage a tire or get a flat out here. The spotty reputation of the Sasquatch Goodyears weighed heavily at the back of my mind the entire trip. It was early afternoon when we happened upon a pull-off next to a lake that we stopped for a stretch and a bite to eat.
and already getting later into the day, we were on the lookout for our next overnight spot to camp. Previously this day, we came to the Zek Pontiac Gatehouse, registered and paid our entrance fee. In the reserve, we were assuming that we'd find some managed and scenic spots to set up at, and we weren't wrong. The first ideal spot we came across we pulled into. This little lot next to a natural boat launch, complete with a beautiful lake view and a fire pit. Unfortunately for us, however, the fire ban was still in place. After getting Lexi set up in her makeshift bug structure, I ventured off to the adjacent boat launch to do what I've been waiting to do for days now. I don't know what the public nudity laws are in the province of Quebec, but on this day, I gladly accept the penalty. The water was absolutely incredible. All washed up and feeling refreshed, it was looking like we were all set up in a great spot for a beautiful sunset view. It's unfortunate, however, that we had so many uninvited guests joining us. I think this day was probably the absolute worst for the deer flies we experienced on this trip. Absolutely unreal. We did the best we could and managed okay. Personally, at this point, I was feeling quite a bit of resentment towards these nasty flies. I had noticed that when one made it inside the netting, it would stupidly fly into the corner and trap itself. This was when I exacted my revenge, exposing an opening in the side of the netting just enough to encourage them inside, just so I could go on an unrelenting and therapeutic murder spree. The following day is when I shockingly discovered my fridge went without power the entire night. It turned out that my fused Chinese Amazon 12 gauge tin copper wire that I bought to power my custom outlet panel ended up being garbage tinned aluminum 14 gauge wire. Packed up and off on what I assumed would be the last day on the loop. If you were paying attention to the video footage from last night, you'll have noticed an artfully produced time-lapse scene. Well, as it turns out, after shooting that footage, I forgot to set the camera back to regular Ultra HD mode, this on the same camera I used to record from the dash. So the rest of the day's travel footage looked like this, and this, and this. And of course, this being the final travel episode of the trip, the accident on the bridge crossing that everybody has been waiting to see was also shot in time lapse, and this is how it looked. If I pull some stills from that footage, the lead up to the bridge, this is the moment it started going off on the side, and when it eventually went in, hung off the side of the bridge. And this is what one does when you realize the serious mess you just got yourself into. However, while the dash cam was in time lapse, I wanted to show what I saw and what I used to help navigate the bridge using the mirror spotter cameras on the Bronco. The camera setup is designed to show you the position of each front wheel, and as you can see, even though I'm using up the entire width of the structure, both wheels seemingly are fully on the bridge with no overhang. This is when I mistakenly believed I was good to make the crossing. But then you can see something give way on the passenger side. It was at this point I should have reversed back off, but looking at the driver's side wheel placement, I assumed I had a little more room there, so I steered over to that side and inched forward. And at this point is when the wheel actually came off the bridge and I just ended up with the wheel hop when trying to move forward. Naturally at this point I put the camera down, realizing the dire situation we're now in. I put the Bronco into reverse and engaged both front and rear lockers. The moment I tried to back it up, it hopped and then came completely off the bridge. 
I think the camera ended up in the passenger area with the dog, Lexi, who was thrown up against the door. Thankfully I had her window up, also I'd hate to imagine how differently our exit might have been. I guess I didn't totally panic as I managed to switch the engine off and roll down my window. Naturally I put the truck in park first out of instinct, which subsequently caused a bit of headache with the recovery. If I remain relatively level headed, the dog however definitely had a panicked look to her. I literally had to grab her and throw her overhead out from the driver's side window. For whatever reason she was reluctant to get out of the truck. It wasn't long before the inevitable water rose up past the camera and submerged it, and finally, eerily dead silence. I only managed to grab my phone before I climbed out myself, the camera rolling the entire time. Some of you may already know, we were fortunate enough to have a couple staying at their cottage about a kilometer up the road. I can only imagine what was going through their thoughts when they saw me and the dog standing in their front yard yelling for help. Of course, recording video footage at this time wasn't the most important thing on my mind, but thankfully, the first thing we did was hop in their pickup truck with a ratchet strap and some chains and headed down to the Bronco. I think I was still under the belief that, at this point, the truck was still salvageable, we'd be able to get it out, air it out, and I'd be able to drive off, finishing our vacation. When we arrived, the truck had already shifted some more off the bridge and was sitting like you've seen it in the initial pictures. We managed to break a chain and little else with the pickup so it was decided we'd bring down the Bombardier tractor and give that a try. However, on our way up with the truck, we lost four wheel drive and it got stuck. We eventually made it back down with the Bombardier to where the truck got stuck and then it stalled out. We found out that there was probably a half a gallon of water in the gas tank Apparently, the last time it was ran was this past winter, so it accumulated a bit of moisture since then. With the pickup truck finally recovered, we ventured back down to the bridge. We decided we needed to clear away some of the overgrown brush to position the Bombardier well enough to pull the Bronco away from the bridge. With the ratchet strap, I anchored the driver's side of the Bronco to the bridge to hopefully prevent it from rolling over into the water. Meanwhile, we were having transmission issues with the tractor. It seemingly just didn't want to pull very well on the Bronco. Keep in mind, however, the Bronco is in park, the parking brake's on, and it's up against a steep bank. After a few more failed pull attempts, we unchained it and headed back up to the cottage. After struggling to make it back up and overheating, we found out that the shift linkage came partially undone and wasn't allowing us to select low range. After doing a field repair with some bailing wire, we were back in business, but also coming to the sad realization that there was no way we were going to get the Bronco recovered that day. Thankfully, Nipper and Joanne put us up for the night and made us feel right at home. I don't know what I would have done without their generosity. That night I didn't sleep a wink, but it wasn't until the early hours of the morning that I thought about the local Facebook recovery pages. Why didn't I think of this already? With the spotty, almost non-existent cell service, I managed to post a pic of the drowned Bronco and the GPS coordinates on Trillium, asking for recovery help. And it was about this time that the picture of my Bronco half underwater broke the internet. But word was out, thankfully, and over the course of the day, the first of a few locals arrived at the scene to lend a hand. With a pair of full-size pickup trucks, a razor side-by-side -side with a 6,000 pound winch, and a fearless swimmer, the plan of attack was to pull with the pickups and use the side-by-side -side to help keep the Bronco from turning into the bridge. But this ended up being just a taste of the mess the Bronco was in. Up against the bridge, backed up against a super steep river bank with the Bronco stuck in park and untold amounts of debris underneath potentially causing issues, she just wasn't budging. However, later that day was when I first got in touch with J.F. Dupree, who was planning on organizing a crew to come up that night and help. Speaking to him on the phone, he definitely gave me some reassurance that they would indeed be able to get the Bronco free. But what condition it would be in after the recovery, it was anyone's guess. But by most accounts, it wasn't looking good. While at work, he had already devised a plan to round up some friends, his recovery gear, and set out on the almost three hour drive north that afternoon from Gatineau, Quebec. Which meant they'd be arriving around 8 o'clock that night. 
With everyone set up with their tents and camping equipment, I just assumed we'd go tackle the recovery first thing in the morning. However, JF had other ideas. He researched online beforehand how to disable the shifter interlock and went about successfully doing so while underwater and in the dark. With giant leeches lurking about, this guy's my new hero. The following morning, with the Bronco now in neutral, JF went about removing the parking brake servo motors, again underwater, which thankfully were just held in place with a single 6mm Allen bolt. With Robert's diesel powered Chevy pickup positioned in place on the Bronco's flank and Marie's Jeep Rubicon set up to do the heavy lifting, it was into the water yet again for Jean Francois to soft shackle the front wheel to the pickup's rear mounted winch. JF was doing his best to ensure minimal damage to the Bronco because of the proximity to the bridge. Because of the amount of pulling that was obviously going to be needed, the Jeep's winch was set up with a double block pulley arrangement and Robert's rear bumper mounted winch was going to use a block as well. This recovery arrangement gives a lot more mechanical leverage to the winch and also minimizes the tensile loads on the cables as opposed to a straight winch pull. At this point so far I think JF needed two leeches pulled off him and I managed to pick up an ankle biter as well. But this didn't stop him from repeatedly getting wet. The man was determined the Bronco was coming out of the water. From overhead you can see just how elaborate the setup is. The V8 Toyota in the middle, the Rubicon anchored from the back way over to the closest tree which was probably 100 feet away and the Chevy with the custom bed on the side. Again JF set up the soft shackle and block to the front wheel in such a way to minimize any kind of body damage to the Bronco. And a second block on the bumper again which multiplied the pulling force of the winch. Of course, Jean-Francois was the one to get wet yet again, anchoring the Wrangler from being pulled into the Bronco. How you doing, Nipper? Good. Enjoying the show? Yeah. It ought to be something. No, it's going to come out wherever you are. Something's going to happen. Yeah, he's got one way in there on a tree. Yeah, something's going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to need to uh, come pick up the, the shackle that I... Do you, you want this one? With a 12,000 pound winch pulling off the front of the Wrangler, strung up between two pulley blocks and anchored at the back to a tree, either the Bronco was coming out of the pond or one or both of the vehicles were going to get ripped in half. The previous night saw a thunderstorm pass through and the rainfall had the water levels definitely up this day. One of the more serious obstacles holding back the recovery was the almost sheer drop off from the bank to where the rear wheels sat, particularly on the passenger side. I managed to shovel out and grade the bank a little bit, but it wasn't going to be enough. JF soft shackled the wheel to a high lift jack to get it up in the air enough to slide a traction board under it to help ease it out of the water. The chainsaw was brought out to give the corner of the bridge a little haircut for clearance as the angles were just playing against us. Only the bare minimum was removed. As if all this wasn't enough, jammed up behind the front driver's side wheel was a piece of 4x4 timber that was half attached to the bridge. Again, JF seemed to have no qualms about getting into the water. Hands up all of you who keep a dive mask and snorkel in your recovery gear. He mentioned, he mentioned it on the phone yesterday at airbag. If it doesn't work for any reason, that's what I would suggest. Thankfully this day we had a bit of break in the heat and humidity which also helped with the devil flies but being still summer in the Great Lakes region I nonetheless kept an eye on the skies. After everything we'd been through a torrential downpour at this point would not have surprised me in the least. Without us able to clear away the 4x4 under the Bronco, GF devised a plan to soft shackle the driver's side wheel to a pulley strapped to the bridge to help pick up that corner of the truck and up over the obstruction. This was run to the winch on the Toyota, but this also served another purpose. 
With the rear passenger wheel coming up the steep embankment, you can see how this would tip the Bronco's sheet metal hard into the bridge structure, something we all wanted to avoid. <laughs> I wish I would have caught it on the film. She was like, mm, that's fancy. <laughs> we, have, we caught a leech trying to get in there. Bad barrel? Bad turtle. Bad turtle. <laughs> yeah. However, because of the extreme short cable run from the pulley to the wheel, Wait, there was only so much room to winch before we risked the shackle getting drawn into the pulley and probably breaking. And with the Bronco also being pulled backwards at the same time, it became a precarious balancing act. With both front wheels attached to winches Great, now, no. we also needed to yeah. keep an eye on the steering direction. Yeah. The last thing we wanted down here was a broken tie rod or a blown apart steering rack. Are you... So you're, you're, you still have tension, uh, Robert? You still have tension on, your, on yours? Asking if I do? Yeah. Yeah, let me see how good it's giving. Yeah, she's coming out of the water on your side. Yeah, keep going a little bit. Want to see how it works? Now maybe the I Jeep a bit? Yeah. It was nice to finally see the wheels turning and some progress being made though. Yeah, hold up on your side. You're turning the wheel. Yeah, hold. The wheel is turning. yeah you're turning it into the bridge right. a bit. Now the While all of this was going on, a curious little turtle decided to show up and investigate all the commotion. I, I cut it yet. Now I'm, I feel pretty confident that I could cut, cut it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we want I the tension right off it now? The, the stump and everything, I'm just going to see. Maybe, maybe, maybe now I can just unhook it. I'm going to check first. And I think we could probably let it go completely, hey? You can also see from here how noticeably higher the driver's side of the Bronco is now, giving us vital clearance to the bridge. With JF position in line with the pole, he signals Marie and the Rubicon to start winding in the winch. With the steering beginning to get further cockeyed, I reached into the Bronco to grab the wheel and hold it straight. Of course, with both front wheels strapped to tensioned lines, the inevitable happened. With the weight of the truck on the line run through the pulley on the bridge, and with the Jeep inching the Bronco rearward, something finally had to let go. While holding the steering wheel in my hand, I got yanked hard past your side by the winch to the pickup, and it fired me straight into the roof. And I got a good tweaking maybe, to my maybe neck. Maybe now I can just unhook it. I'm gonna check first, and I think we could probably let it go completely. Hey, not always are the hazards of rigging a heavy recovery so obvious, but they're lurking everywhere, ready to bite. Of course, we lost a little ground with the bad mule lurching ahead a bit, but the good news was the line didn't break. Uh, we could we could bind the the foreigner uh, winch a little more still, so we we could we could. Give some on the fo the, on the winch of the foreigner, just to, so we go all the way closer to the yeah more tension on the foreigner, just like a. Uh, Is there enough room on mm -hmm. the enough line? <clears throat> Easy. It looked like you didn't have any cable left. Sorry? You didn't look it didn't look like you had any cable. Well you got a little bit of cable left.
No, it's, uh, yeah. it's basically this line is mm -hmm. so that doesn't... Are you able to turn your wheels straight again? What? I went through a, a big water crossing. Oh, there goes the wheel. I like the wheel straight now. We managed to clear the obstruction on the driver's front wheel and continued winching back towards the Jeep. With the steering wheel cranked over to the driver's side, we ended up with lots of room between the Bronco and the bridge. Is that, is that passing your wheel right out of the water now? With the bridge pulley finally having done its work, it was cut free and the winch line of the 4 runner was cleared out of the way. Getting the rear passenger wheel up on shore was a major hurdle, but you can still see how that wanted to tip the Bronco into the bridge. I guess not wanting to believe it would be a total loss, or if in fact the insurance would cover it at all, we were still concerned with not wanting to cause any additional damage to the truck. With large timbers lying under and behind the front wheels, the plan now was to crank the steering over to the other way and see if we could get the Bronco to roll up over them. There's a lot of lumber in there. What's that? There's a lot of lumber and logs. This whole thing is just slowly building the lumber. That people just build shitty bridges on top of shitty bridges. And push the old stuff off. Or... I don't want to have to carry that out and go to the water. From Marie's perspective, winching from inside the Jeep, you could see the plan work beautifully rolling the front wheel of the Bronco right out of the water and back onto the firm ground. Here you can see the soft shackle that was used in the front wheel and just some of the scattered debris we had to deal with. But at this point, we knew we had it. Oh, that passed underneath, thank God. Looking at the high water marks on the windshield, you can see how just far pitched down it was in the water. Just utterly shocking. With a freewheeling but otherwise dead truck down at the bottom of this road, the next step of recovery was to tow the bad mule out using this clever tow bar setup that Jean-Francois put together. Have a look at how he utilized D-rings to make it all work on the Bronco's recovery points. Pretty cool. With the bad mule now hitched to the V8 Forerunner, we were finally out on our way. Of course it couldn't have all been so easy on the way out. On one particular section with a long steep hill comprised of loose rocks, the combined weight of the Bronco and the Toyota was just too much to ask of the tires and was just spinning. Because Marie was behind us in the Jeep, JF had us roll back and into the shoulder enough for the Wrangler to get by and strap us to the tow vehicle. It's not often you see a Jeep pulling a trailer, pulling a Toyota, pulling a Bronco. This alone should bring out all the keyboard warriors in the comment section. Once we made it to one of the main roads, JF had a trailer prearranged to meet us to load the Bronco onto. And then it was back down to the Gatineau region where we unloaded the Bronco, Jean-Francois and Marie put us up for the night.
The following day, with the help from Kevin, who thankfully had the day off work, we went about removing my gear and accessories from the Bronco and finally arranging a rental pickup truck to get us back home. The rest of the story is pretty much well documented and you can follow up on it on the playlist link here. As it turns out, getting the Bronco recovered was just the beginning of the calamity. When I was finally able to speak with an insurance agent, I was informed that the Bronco would most almost certainly be a total loss. So it was then that I decided to strip it and have it brought back to a local shop in Gatineau instead of bringing it home. As for the recovery, what an amazing professional job performed by everyone there especially Jean-Francois. As you saw, it definitely took all three vehicles working together to get the Bronco free from the water, being as stuck as it was. But it also took as much, if not more, strategy and finesse as it did brute force to get it done. I don't know about you, but I can't remember watching such a skillful recovery where a four x four stuck nose down deep in a pond with all four wheels locked up. Well, at least initially locked up. Truly an amazing job. Many thanks again to everyone involved. I don't know what I've done without your generosity and help. The plan going forward is to definitely find another Bronco for next summer. Whether new or used, I don't yet know. Either way, it's not gonna be easy or cheap. If you enjoyed this episode or others, consider becoming a subscriber to the channel and help support future episodes like this one, and especially the travel and adventure series. I still have many trips planned for the future and I'd love to have you along for the ride. Until next time, we'll see you here again on The Lonely Overlander.